Assalamu alaikum. Uh, greeting from uh, PGMI, Postgraduate Medical uh, Institute, Peshawar. I'm Dr. Iqbal, Assistant Professor of Medical Education, PGMI. Uh, I would like to start with the introduction of the participant uh, and panel of this uh, webinar session. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Muntaz as a deputy CEO, and uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Sanaul Lajan as a coordinator of the program and a chairman, uh, Dr. Muhammad Arif. Uh, he was absent from uh, webinar session. Dr. Muntaz will act like uh, we will be introduce the participant. Uh, we have a moderator. I'm uh, act as a moderator, and we have Dr. Ishfaq as a moderator. So I, I'm giving the session to the um, uh, Dr. Mumtaz for the introduction and brief uh, brief of the introduction program of the webinar session, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ishfaq, for the introduction. I'm overwhelmed to see all the participants. Uh, this is really a pleasure to see you all in this webinar. Welcome to PGMI webinar on the simulation based learning. This is actually one of the uh, first of its kind uh, to be arranged and hosted by PGMI. I hope everybody knows about the magnitude uh, of the skill lab, uh, the new skill lab actually, which has started recently and uh, Allow me, okay. fully equipped, uh, probably uh, one of the two largest skill labs in Pakistan. So one of them, you know, we have in AKU, Karachi, while the second one is uh, in Peshawar. This is a pleasure <clears throat> and pride, in fact. Uh, Dr. Iqbal Wahid told you about the moderators. Uh, Dr. Essence City will be <clears throat> the facilitator and the main chunk will be, of course, over to him. Uh, again, you are most welcome to the webinar and uh, I hope you get most of it, out of it. Uh, over to Dr. Iqbal uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, we have uh, a speaker from Qatar University, Dr. Hassan Siti. Uh, he is a young gen uh, genet and he is a young and talented uh, medical visionist in the era of medical education. Uh, he is a PhD from the Dundee University and a fellowship from FEMA. Uh, he will discuss about the simulation, uh, uh, simulation learning and teaching. How is the is that uh, alternative method to perform uh, uh, the best performance in the uh, clinical skill lab? So I'm delivering the session to Hassan City for further collaboration. Sir, Dr. Hassan City. Thank you very much, Dr. Iqbal and Dr. Ishfaq for, for the nice introduction and uh, for the inviting me over to PGMI. Uh, I think I can't share my screen. Host has disabled the screen sharing facility. So if you can please allow me. So uh, and meanwhile, you do that. I think what we can do is I can introduce myself briefly. So my name is Dr. Sanseti and uh, I'm working here as a program coordinator for Masters in Health Professional Education program at Qatar University. Uh, before coming here, uh, I was part of Khyber Medical University and uh, I was working on certificate course uh, and master's course over there as well. We also introduced the same courses at University of Lahore, Rafa University. And then uh, for a period of time, I was involved with Pakistan Medical and Dental Council as well as a co-opted member for uh, the Medical Education Committee. In that committee, we, uh, what we did in 2018 we developed uh, standards for curriculum development, standards for medical education. And if you remember, there were a lot of inspections that happened on the new performa for the undergraduate courses. So I was part of the people who actually developed those Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, yes. yes. So thank you very much uh, once again, PGMI, Dr. Ishfaq uh, and Dr. Iqbal for inviting me over. And it's a pleasure speaking um, at my home institution and in my home country and in my home city as well. 
So today we are going to discuss about simulation in clinical teaching and learning. Um, I've already introduced a little bit about myself and uh, from where I am currently. So all of you are welcome for FIFA 2022 World Cup if you plan on traveling to Qatar. So you can always visit me and uh, you can, I can show you around as well the beautiful city of Doha and Qatar. Uh, let's start with a nice video. Let's look at this video. And uh, while you're watching this video, I want you, uh, I'll have some questions for uh, the audience and then you can answer me in your chat. Okay, let's watch this video first. substance we shall find? Uh, subcutaneous fat, sir. Quite right. And then we come across the surgeon's worst enemy, which is what? Speak up, man. Blood, you numb skull. You cut a patient, he bleeds until the processes of nature form a dot and stop it. This interval is known scientifically as the bleeding time. You, what's the bleeding time? Uh, ten past ten, sir. So uh, I want you to write in the chat, what do you think were the problems with such teaching or such environment? Uh, I think people, especially uh, who have been trained uh, like five, six or 10 years ago, uh, they had such environment. And even now I see a lot of specialities. They have a different style of teaching and different way of teaching and different way things are going on. So have you experienced teaching like this? If you can put that in the chat for me, uh, any experiences do you think uh, if you have experienced any such teaching or anything, what did you do or any comments on what we have just seen? Okay, so I can start looking at comments. So anything anyone wants to write? So if there's nothing, then I will go ahead and continue to talk, but I'll just see if there's anything anyone. So they have not followed the ethics. Yes, ethical protocols. They were arrogant, exactly. So consider the way they have to keep the Momina says she has experienced that as well. Okay. Ethics, yes. And in terms of teaching, you saw the way he was humiliating the trainees and uh, the way he was talking to the students, the way patient was re reacting and responding to everything. And there were like six, seven, eight, uh, or 10 different students sitting over there. So. If you look at uh, what was happening over there in this situation, so I think the most and one of the commonest method of teaching in many specialities, uh, it's more prevalent in some specialities than others and more prevalent in some colleges and especially in the public sector than others. I hope and I think a lot of it has changed over the period of time, but humiliation, and it's not just in Pakistan, it's worldwide, world over, uh, especially, uh, sorry to say, uh, for like, surgeons or things like that they have to express some power over people and that is how 
I think humiliation was known as one of the method of teaching to encourage uh, learning processes. The other issue that we could see in this entire scenario was related to multiple level of learners. So there were trainees of different levels. So I think every morning you have to go on rounds and then there's the registrar over there, there are trainees, there are medical students, finally medical students, there are all of different levels and their learning is different as well. And as a teacher, you have to engage all those different learners with different levels of understanding and it becomes really very difficult. So there are some students who are just standing there unable to see what's happening with the patient. Likewise, there is non-structured teaching going on. So I remember one time we used to go for uh, the ward or something like that. They used to see what patient is available and whatever patient was available, they used to take us to the bed and we used to examine and we used to do all the things over there. And I remember uh, examining the kidney so many times, examining the liver so many times and doing the same things again and again. So if you get a rotation in winters, you get to see one kind of patients. If you get a rotation in summers, you get to see another kinds of patients. So there's a lack of structure as well. It's not like you actually follow up the same curriculum and everyone gets exposed to the same kind of patients, same kind of learning environment, and everyone is achieving same learning objectives. Some people go to the uh, operation theater and the undergraduate or in the postgraduate, they're learning different things based on their own enthusiasm, based on the kind of cases they get. And some people are learning differently because they don't get the same opportunities uh, in that environment. Another issue is about briefing. So the patient was not briefed earlier on. So it's fine to have uh, examination, a lot of things done on real patients. And uh, I think uh, we are quite fortunate that our patients still allow us to be examined by students and for learning purposes. Uh, I've seen a lot of studies from Australia and UK where they only allow, they don't allow examination of any kind of students. And I think even in Peshawar, if you go to Northwest and Rahman Medical College and so many other places, you will see that there is some difficulty in getting those students to actually examine uh, the patient, especially when they are paying out of pocket. And it's the same in the Western world uh, that they don't allow. And then there have been a lot of lawsuits cases that the doctors encourage uh, the patients, the students that these patients are under general anesthesia and under GA, they allow ask them to examine and learn different skills. And later on, the students actually reported such doctors that uh, they have been very unprofessional in the line of teaching. So there is some issue in terms of briefing of the patients as well as briefing of the students in terms of what is happening. Now, I, we see a lot of professors, a lot of assistant professors, they are very busy uh, professionals doing a lot of managerial work. I think with MTI and so many other things, they are getting even more busier. They have to compete in terms of research. They have to do different teaching. They have to do their clinical hours and they are involved in so many different activities that they have to do and they don't even have time for teaching, which takes a low priority when it comes, when you compare it with services or when you compare it with research. So uh, the interesting fact in Pakistan is that uh, we have not differentiated the academic track with the clinical track. So anyone who has been a surgeon is also or becomes a professor of surgery, even if he is not teaching. So someone is a registrar and automatically they become after five, 10 or eight years, they become a professor. Uh, other, in other places in the developed world, what happens is that you may be a good consultant and that is what you are. You don't become a professor because for that you have to teach in the academia and you have to have some good research, but it's not the same. It's, uh, the same in Pakistan. And I think that is one of the issues. Another issue is lack of incentive and rewards for teaching. So I know, uh, and I had discussed with a lot of supervisors, a lot of good clinicians don't even want to become supervisors. Now I think uh, they have linked it up with their promotion that you have to be a supervisor in order to get promoted. But a lot of them don't even want to teach because in services or in research or in other ways. Likewise, there are numerous challenges in terms of inpatient teaching as well. For example, uh, you don't have teaching, difficult to set teaching goals, unanticipated events are happening uh, here and there during inpatient teaching at the same time. The patients are too sick or they are unwilling to participate in teaching. So patients are very sick and you don't want them to be disturbed or, or they don't want to be disturbed. Patient stays are becoming shorter. So it's becoming harder. I remember, Patients used to stay there for two to three days, but now uh, technology has advanced so much that you get operated one day and after a day you get discharged. 
So their stay has gone shorter uh, and it's hard for students to actually follow the natural history of diseases. Uh, we don't send our students to their homes to actually do home visits and to learn about how the disease is progressing or how the management uh, has actually uh, improved the situation. Trainees and teachers feel insecure about admitting errors in front of patients and the rest of medical team and these are other issues. There are likewise challenges to outpatient teaching like busy clinical setting. So I remember going to the OPD in the Khyber Teaching Hospital and standing over there and there was no space for students or even uh, patients to come over. And it was very difficult for uh, the teacher to actually teach us anything uh, in a good manner or in a proper manner, or if we did not have that much opportunities to actually practice what he was telling us uh, in that environment. Teaching time was often short, no time for elaborate teaching, no control over distribution and organization of time uh, about that. Learning and service taking places concurrently, so clinical services taking happening, and multiple patient problems needs to be addressed simultaneously, so teachers cannot focus on one problem to teach. Now, with all these problems, we are still producing a lot of good graduates, and they are going worldwide and doing a lot of good things because of the way the clinical arena is, and they do a lot of hands-on in our environment, and things are happening in a good way. But we, when we look at the statistics uh, worldwide, so this is a very nice study by Leap and Lombardi, and uh, he found out, uh, he actually compared different organizations, uh, and in organizations, he compared them based on uh, the number of preventable fatalities. So people who died actually, but it could have been prevented easily. So he compared, he took the data, because a lot of people say in healthcare, a lot of people are sick, so they are more likely to die but he just focused on the cases which could have been prevented. So preventable fatalities. And when he compared across them, he found that healthcare is one of the most dangerous organizations. So more than one person out of 1000 who walks into the hospital actually dies. It's the same as, or even higher than anyone going for a mountain climbing or a bungee jumping. And interestingly, working in nuclear power is considered safe airline industry is considered safe. Working in on railroad or going on road or flights or chemical manufacturing industry are still considered safer than healthcare industry. This has been reported in some other studies as well. Uh, and they reported increasing errors that are happening in the modern medicine and uh, how they actually managed to find out. They found out about them through lawsuits, through malpractices, through different patient complaints that they're getting all the time. And based on that, they see that there's a lot of uh, things happening, medical errors happening every other day. I just uh, was looking at some of the news and uh, I came across this. Uh, I think this is a very famous case from Lady Leading Hospital where a transgender Alicia succumbs to wound at Peshawar Hospital. And the doctors kept asking the injured Alicia if she danced only and how much she charged, whereas the blood laboratory guy asked them if their blood was HIV positive or not. So that is what happened in Peshawar, but it's not just related to Peshawar. So this is what happened in another institute. And in Farzana's case, the doctor who was supposed to perform surgery did not show up and someone else replaced her. When they realized that they had messed up the surgery, the doctors disappeared. They did not take the patient or her family into confidence. Instead, they began avoiding them altogether. So there are multitude of problems with technical as well as non-technical uh, abilities of our doctors that we are producing in different institutions based on the teaching and training that is happening, which means there is something going wrong with the teaching and training environment and how we can improve it. It's so bad and it's not just in our country. Um, again, this is a very nice satire that was written uh, by someone uh, in the West and they said patient leaves hospital alive. So that's a story. So there was widespread shock today at the news that a patient had left a hospital today without having been killed by a medical error. So it's not just Pakistan, it's world over this is happening. A spokesman for the hospital said, this is a very rare occurrence and there's no cause for alarm. We will be launching a full inquiry at once into what went right. We can only apologize to the undertakers. Again, if we look at the top causes of adverse events, you'll see a lot of events that went bad are because of poor communication. So 60% of the errors is because of the individual poor communication and 70% of the team poor communication. Now communication isn't something that we can't correct. 
but do we really focus on these things i think there's a lot of focus on technical skills in our teaching and learning environment but we're not focusing a lot on the effective domain or the behavioral domain we're not focusing on improving communication skills i'm not sure if we have been taught enough about the prescribing skills we need to learn about patient assessment we need to focus on that procedural compliance environmental security leadership and uh, situations like disasters so we had gone through a lot of disaster situations bomb blasts in last few uh, many few years and i think our emergency department is very well prepared and equipped for handling such situations but do we have have we developed leadership or are we currently developing our trainees or our undergraduate students as leaders uh, for such environments or not so there's a switch cheese model as well which was uh, proposed by james reason and he actually found out that a lot of errors that are happening it's not because of the individuals they are because of the systems and it's because of the poor system to train them in a poor manner the way things have been organized and all those different things that are happening so it's not just about individuals but also the entire system and shifting responsibilities i think we don't teach our trainees about handovers how to do them properly i know a lot of uh, trainees myself a lot of my colleagues did uh, their uh, fcps training and in that training what used to happen they used to just uh, say okay another doctor is coming they used to call them and say okay uh, i have just left the patient the ward please join or take my duty or something there is no proper handover that used to happen in a proper manner uh, i've been to uh, dundee uh, in nine wells hospital over there they used to sit together in front of each other and they used to discuss each case and uh, there used to be a formula like s bar where they used to talk about the situation the background and recommendations and analysis and so many things and that's how proper handover used to happen between uh, doctors of the patients and i think there are some issues related to that but so what this had been happening we are still doing good we are still producing good doctors they are passing usmle they are passing clab examinations they are doing quite well in pakistan why now what's the worry i think the world around us is evolving the world around us is changing as well and uh, uh, i'm not saying that what we are doing we are doing bad or we are doing wrong but i think we need to improve things i'll give give you an example of uh, nokia phones i think all of us had a nokia phone and um, now how many of us will actually have a nokia phone i think most of us now either have samsung or an iphone why because nokia kept on doing what they were doing they were best in what they were doing but they did not evolve with the changing environment the samsung and uh, iphone industry they caught up because they changed the entire industry likewise uh, how many of you remember the kodak films i remember putting the film in the camera and taking pictures and everything and um usme bhi pata chalta tha ki kuch pictures jal gayi hain or something like that happened but now the industry has moved into more digital cameras kodak industry is down uh, with so many things so a lot of things are changing worldwide and they are going digitalized so i'm not saying that what we have been doing we are doing wrong but i think now we need to evolve with the changing times the patient we used to deal with earlier that has changed as well the society has changed as well uh, so previously what we used to do we used to uh, a lot of colleges and there was a case as well where they used to take and actually um go to black cemeteries and rob the graves and to, took the dead out and they were used in medical school for learning purposes so it used to happen in america as well but now the world is evolving uh, i think in uh, pakistan there's dis- decrease in patient stay we can't rely that the patient will be there for 3 4 days for all the students to learn different things the training time is also decreasing so um, i remember uh, so earlier in medicine and surgery so uh, people especially who are doing specialization they don't spend enough time in general medicine so they have to i know that after two years they move into uh, their specialties but in those two years they spend quite a lot of time in rotations and if you look back uh, the amount of medicine general medicine that they have done is almost 12 to 14 weeks or 12 to 14 months which is not a lot of time to learn general medicine they are just focus on their specialties so i think we need to think about out of the box Uh, if we are providing them the right experiences in covid times a lot of learning did not happen in a structured manner we just sent everyone to the isolation ward we just sent everyone to the covid wards because that was where they were required i understand that services are important but do you really think in terms of teaching and training 
We are actually, uh, we trained them in a structured manner. We provided them with the right amount of experiences in their learning environment. Accountability is increasing as well uh, in regards to, I remember now uh, every other politician or prime minister or chief minister or everyone, they just keep on coming to the hospital and they just keep on asking questions about what is happening, what is not happening in terms of training. And uh, because we need to produce better doctors, they need to be better prepared. Uh, are they prepared in handling all the situations? Uh, but do are we really preparing them through our curriculum? Likewise, even the chief justice keeps on visiting us uh, in the past. Now I'm glad that they are not visiting that more. And demands of increasing vocal patients. So there was a very famous uh, case of Shermino Boy Chinoy uh, who went with her sister or something. And uh, I think a house officer asked for her number or just uh, Googled her, her somewhere and then and sent her a Facebook request. And then she complained and there was a lot of issues around that. But have we prepared our students for all those different scenarios? Have we prepared our students or trainees that if a medical error happens, how we are going to handle that? So today I'm not just going to focus on uh, simulation with regards to technical abilities because I know for technical skills, we are using simulation a lot of times. Even I, as a very junior doctor, used to um, practice syringes in an orange or something like that. So I know we have been using simulation in so many different ways, but that was only for the technical skills. Today, we are going to discuss and go beyond just technical skills as well that along with technical skills, there are a lot of non-technical things, behavioral skills and human factors that you need to remember as well. And likewise, uh, in the COVID pandemic times where it was hard for students to actually go to the patients and have a contact with them, uh, I think they had a big gap in their training. So uh, in so many countries that I know, they actually ensured that students get to do another extra year in order for them to actually do their clinical practices. But I think in Pakistan, we just allowed them to go through uh, without uh, clinical training, which is a bit sad and something we need to look into as well. Now, how reliable organizations have improved their systems? So if we want to improve upon uh, healthcare and all the situation, we need to look at reliable organizations. And the most reliable organization that we found was an airline industry. And in the airline industry, we found out that they developed standard and shared open reporting system. They used simulation to learn. So it's not like you just go ahead and start uh, a plane and just go on a ride, just like that. You have to do a certain number of hours in a simulated setting where you have to lift off the plane, you have to fly the plane, and then you have to uh, go down uh, properly and land it properly uh, in a simulated environment. And the same thing is being done at NASA where they practice a lot of things. And then there are standard procedure practices that they rehearse all the time. That if this happens, this is what you need to rehearse. This is what you need to do. If this happens, this is what you need to do. And I think we have been rehearsing that for basic life support for, for the CPR procedure. We are doing that continuously in our environment. But I think we need to rehearse a lot of other scenarios as well. It's not just the advanced trauma life support courses or the basic life support courses or advanced cardiac life support courses that are enough. I think we need to bring simulation into the entire curriculum and integrate it in a proper way where students can rehearse and practice standard procedures. And they should be um, very proficient in those different skills. Likewise, they developed standard for crew resource management training as well. And I think all of that needs to be inculcated in healthcare system. And I, this is what has been proposed uh, in a very nice uh, article in 2019 as well, that why hospitals should fly. So they are proposing that hospitals and the training environment should work like simulation and simulated environment as well. Now, what is simulation? So all this detail I've been talking about is to help you realize and understand that what are the problems in our system and how we can improve it. And I think simulation is an answer to a lot of problems that are happening in our system and the way students are being trained and it's not their fault. They have not, they did not get enough opportunities. We have 300 students doing something or 150 students, but do they get enough opportunities? Do they, and if they don't have enough patients, do we provide them enough simulated learning um, environment or simulated patient or enough time for them to practice and rehearse different things. So what is simulation? Now, this is a definition by GABA, a technique and not a technology. Now, this is something you need to understand. 
it's not a technology. It's not just you just bring a nice doll. I've been to different colleges uh, and, and all those colleges, they have very nicely placed dolls and mannequins very nicely tucked into a glass a cupboard and they just keep it there and that's where it lies. But I think PGMI has developed a very nice simulated center. KGMC has developed a nice simulated center and Aachen, there's a very nice simulated center as well uh, where there are Simmans and Harvey and so many different advanced tools. But now it's time that we start utilizing them for improvement and for teaching and training purposes as well. And uh, for that, I, I'm glad that PGMI is playing a, a good role uh, towards that. So it's a technique or a technology to replace or amplify real experiences with guided experiences, often immersive in nature. So you have to immerse students in that. It's not just you just put a doll on the carpet and just say, okay, give CPR. You need to immerse the student and make them realize that it's the actual scenario. It's a real human being and you need to immerse and you need to play out in the same way because otherwise your student will panic. I'm happy to give CPR to a mannequin to a doll on the floor, but if someone falls in front of me, do I have the same level of confidence to actually start CPR and allow myself to break his ribs, his ribs all over again? Like I have to think about all those things. So you have to emotionally involve a student in this process as well uh, when you are teaching them in a simulated environment that evoke or replicate substantial aspect of the real world in a full interactive fashion. So I'm going to discuss uh, about different simulation types and different fidelities in my uh, slides that are coming forward, but you need to understand that it's not just a technology. I remember I, we were doing um, a, a midwifery course uh, for uh, midwives of uh, KPK in uh, Kuwait Teaching Hospital. And uh, in that course, I remember we brought a mannequin who used to deliver the baby as well. And that was for teaching and training purpose. We brought it for like six or 10,000 US dollars. And I think after the second week, uh, the baby leg was broken and it was not never used after that because no one could fix it and no one knew how to work it. Uh, so I think we need to use these things properly and we need to start working on developing things indigenously as well. We can't rely on someone else to just provide us with all the things, uh, especially uh, a lot of skin sheets. And I'm glad that there's a workshop I've seen uh, on my visit to Rahman Medical College that they have developed a nice workshop where they are actually producing a lot of materials indigenously for students to practice on as well, which is something that we, uh, I'm not sure if PGMI is doing, but they need to do uh, that as well. So a person, device, or set of conditions. So this is another definition by Eisenberg that it could be a person, so a simulated patient or a standardized patient. It could be a device or it is the set of conditions which attempts to present education and evaluation problems authentically. So authenticity is important. Just like it needs to be real life. Like you need to ensure the authenticity in order for it to be real. The student or trainee is required to respond to the problem as she would under natural circumstances. Now, what are the different types of simulation? So simulation does not always involve expensive mannequins, but many things count as simulation. Some of them are still being used from hundred of years ago. Like I mentioned about oranges, that's how a lot of nurses, a lot of doctors learn to give injections. Those who are taking uh, advanced trauma courses, um, I think in mixed official surgery, they are using bones or they're using lambs or chickens and chicken bones and they're learning uh, intraosseous cannulation in chicken, chicken bones and so many different things. And so many uh, other simulated models that we have been using as well and practicing things on animals. This is the simplest form of, uh, I would say simulator which are most likely called task trainers. So you just pick a small task, IV cannulation, IM, taking temperature or doing suturing. You just use a small task and you just design a simulation based on that. This is the easiest and simplest form of simulation. They are called task trainers or part task trainers. You can use them separately or you can attach them uh, with a real human being as well to give them an experience as well because uh, Right now, if I'm practicing IV cannulation on this hand, it's, it may be easier for me, but if I see a patient who's actually moving the hand all the time and talking to me at the same time and is very anxious, I may not be able to show the same level of confidence. So you have to attach this hand with a real human being just to show and train the human being or the simulated patient to actually react in a manner that the patient would foresee in the actual clinical setting. 
just to improve its authentic authenticity. So that is how you improve and make it more real life and immerse your students. Dissection simulators, they are increasingly becoming common. So I remember I went uh, to uh, one of the conference and I said, it's a nice model. And they said, don't call it a model, it's a replica. So then they made me feel the skin and everything. And they showed that it's exactly human-like. And it's not just a model, but an exact replica of how a human hand or, or an arm looks like. And, and that is what we need to um, consider as well. Another simpler form, I remember um, my teacher, uh, Dr. Mohammed Noor Wazir, uh, and he rem I remember at that time he used to bring speakers to the classroom for us to hear out different heart sounds and um, for us to hear different respiratory sound and different things as well. So I think this is more common and still prevalent in difficult areas such as pediatrics where we can't have simulated patients in geriatrics or in psychiatry patients or with behavioral science issues uh, where we can't have simulated patient and it's hard to train someone in psychiatry or uh, have a geriatric patient do something or have a pediatric simulated patient do something. So in these cases, we still use and reliant on different presentations or videos and sound recordings. The recording provides a consistent scenario and enables important aspect of clinical competence to be assessed and audio recordings of human sound and murmurs as well. Likewise, um, I have used, for example, I'm just sitting on the chair in this picture but I am giving the entire experience to the student. So if the student is examining the stomach or the student examining the baby or anything like that, they are at the same time communicating with the patient. So we have kept communication totally separate and we have kept our technical skills totally separate. So I think we need to integrate these two as well over a period of time where the student should learn that how to communicate with the patient and at the same time do the procedure or do the examination or do different things. Likewise, there's a Harvey simulator as well, which uh, creates the cardiac sounds uh, and uh, recreates the respiratory sounds and students can learn about these different things as well in that scenario. There are virtual and haptic system, especially for endoscopy and colonoscopy. You can see there's a face here and uh, here you can see. So uh, I, th there are tubes over here. So you just move on tubes and you can actually feel the pressure, you can feel the tension, you can see that how much pain you are causing to the patient and the screen actually shows you and gives you feedback on all that, those things so that you learn about how to do endoscopy and colonoscopy in a proper manner. Uh, I remember we never had those facilities available and we had to do a lot of things on real patients. And then a lot of students were reluctant to do it and they were not even encouraged to do that. But I think we need to prepare uh, our trainees, our students for all these different scenarios. And for that simulation has a big role. And this is something we need to work on develop as well. Likewise, uh, technology has advanced so much. There are integrated simulators, which are instructor driven like SimMan, MentiMan, and uh, they you can run as many scenarios as possible in them. What usually happens, this is a room. If you look at this room, everything around here is real. All the monitors, everything except for the patient. And even this patient, I think even SimMan recreates a lot of things. For example, it recreates uh, uh, it, the color of his face changes. He cries, he laughs, he makes noises, he makes sounds, and you can even speak through it through the speaker as well. And if you can see this screen on that side, so from that screen, we are sitting on the other side of the screen. So this is the same screen and we can directly see, it's just like the squash coat. In squash court, there's a screen where the players cannot see outside, but audience can see inside. So it's the same screen that they have placed over there. So from the other side, we are looking and observing what is happening uh, to the patients uh, and how, uh, or how the student is performing. And we are managing and controlling uh, the algorithms for the entire scenario. For example, if someone is uh, giving them a medicine, so that we need to enter that that the medicine has been given so that the uh, blood pressure starts going down and the patient, simulated patient starts responding in a different manner. So all these things, and I think uh, there's an increasing focus on simulation fidelity as well. Now, what is the term fidelity means is the degree to which a simulated experience approaches reality. So I've been talking about reality. I think reality is very important because we have to ensure immersion of students in the entire scenario. We have to stop focusing on just one bit where we are using that 
orange or something like that for technical skills, but we have to recreate the entire environment where the student can learn and practice different things. So fidelity is important. The level of fidelity is determined by the environment, by the tools, by the resources, and many factors associated with the partners. So uh, unfortunately, our simulated centers are just in one hall or one room, and that is where we expect everyone to practice. We need to recreate an entire hospital, or if not an hospital, at least a ward. We need to recreate an operation theater. We need to recreate uh, all these different rooms which are in the hospital, exactly in the same situation. So in my simulated center, I see everything nicely painted walls and everything. But when I actually go to a hospital, it's in a totally different condition. Am I able to recreate? Am I able to perform in the same manner? There are questions. So we have to recreate the exact same situation which happens in the real life. So a lot of violent patients or patient, if, what if the patient's family becomes violent? What do you need to do? Have we prepared our training for that? Have we prepared our doctors for that? We need to recreate all those scenarios. It's not just about technical skills, but about behavioral skills as well, about effective domain as well, uh, and not just psychomotor domain. What things bring in physical fidelity? So these are the things. You invest more on bringing actual blood uh, bags. You bring in actual medicines over there, actually actual real insulin pin, real environment. And that is where you bring in the physical or environmental fidelity, which refers to the surroundings, the resources, the actual environment that should mirror the actual clinical arena. So this is physical fidelity. The other thing is conceptual fidelity. Now, conceptual fidelity refers to the believability of a scenario. So it's not just about you just put a doll over there, but you have to develop a scenario where you explain to the student about the patient physical condition, and then the patient should actually respond to such intervention. So these monitors should respond to such interventions, the ECG should change, uh, the respiratory rate, the oxygen saturation, and things should evolve and change as you progress or as you treat or as you manage a patient. And all of that needs a lot of resources. All of that needs a lot of people who need to be involved in that simulated center. And it requires a lot of investment. But I think this will really change the way our doctors have been trained and they have been assessed. Uh, and this is what we need to work on as well. Likewise, psychological fidelity. So here you can see it's a real patient, but on the neck, there's a small simulated task trainer. So although the student is just inserting it uh, or inserting that thing in that simulator, in that plastic, but it's attached to a real human being. So he or she is getting the same sort of experience that if she has to put a ventilator or some, anything like that, what kind of experience or how the patient might get angry, might get frustrated, or what she or she needs to do. Over here in Qatar, we have a center of excellence in ITCAN. And uh, here we are actually even doing knowledge as well. So this is all makeup. What is knowledge? It's, it's, it's just the makeup, and it's a French word that means casting or molding. And it has been used uh, for centuries to create models. Uh, but now we are using it to create real conditions, real patients, uh, difficult scenarios. Uh, we are training people because the FIFA World Cup is happening over here. They are training people for disaster situations. We, they are still working on, God forbid anything happens, how the doctors need to react, how the paramedics need to react uh, if anything happens. Because it's a very international big event that is happening and they need to prepare everyone for that. And that is why there's regular training happening for a lot of doctors. Do we really do that in our own country when any event like that happens? Are we even trained to deal with disasters? Are we just panicked? Are we just uh, unable to handle these situations? So um, this is something knowledge, which is very important to set the stage of scenario objectives, enhances assessment opportunities as well, supports decision-making, create meaningful clues, uh, create realistic training situations and engage all the senses in that learning experience because you see everything is real, provide stress inoculation. I remember when I was in Dundee, they actually used to do makeup on the students and they especially invited people from black color because they said that a lot of books that we have have only shown injuries in white color patients. We want to see that how injuries actually look on a black colored person or a, on a brown skin so that our students have an exposure to different lesions how they actually appear in that way. And then they are able to practice in that many situations. Likewise, uh, in terms of other simulations, we have moved on to 
computer simulation as well. Especially during the COVID-19 period, a lot of uh, websites and a lot of tools where a lot of th things were happening in, uh, uh, in the computers. And likewise, if you are playing Oculus Rift, we use Oculus Rift I have to, for playing cricket. They are using Oculus Rift to actually visualize and to see in virtual reality how patients and how different things will look. Look, let's watch this video and see. The wrist is composed of eight carpal bones arranged into two distinct rows, a proximal row and a distal row. These small bones provide flexibility to the wrist. There are four bones in each row. Likewise, there's sectra table or anatomy table to help people learn about dissection, about OT about surgery, about how to do things, what are different layers. Nowadays, there's augmented reality and magic mirror system. So you just stand in front of a mirror and it starts showing you what's inside you and you can just learn from your own self, from your own body. Uh, likewise, there are applications nowadays. So uh, I've been working with some staff members from College of Engineering and uh, they are working on a lot of projects with artificial intelligence as well to help people diagnose, to help people learn. And now there are a lot of applications which you can just use to actually learn a lot of things as well. And then there are game-based simulation as well, where you play different games. They ask you to perform different tasks. You do them and then you score higher and you learn about where to put uh, the ECG leads. So there's a 12 lead ECG challenge. Uh, there's a surgery challenge and so many different challenges that use gamification to actually learn and use simulations for learning purposes as well. Now, the question is, what is the, how you are going to actually choose what type of simulation you're going to use? So when you're going to choose or select, you need to ask yourself the following questions. What are the expected learning outcomes? What is the type of simulation that best matches objectives? Do I need to immerse the lectures, the learners, or will they practice discrete skills? What levels are my learning? Obviously, as a first year student, I will not just bring him in front of a sim man. But if it's a trainee who's about to graduate, I'll expect a lot more from that person. How close to reality does the simulation need to be? Initially, you don't have to bring that in that manner, but once the students have practiced in a different condition, you can bring such an environment. So choose what best supports the learning objectives, learners and resources that are available. Why use simulation? A lot of people still say we don't need simulation. I think in this situation, what do you expect happens next? So there's a wolf and there's a rabbit. We all know what would, what would happen. But if you train the rabbit properly, this is what can happen. So we need to train our rabbits in a way so that they can react to unexpected situations. And it's not just a simulated center that would be enough. We need to integrate all of that into our curriculum. We need to ensure that it is properly linking with our learning outcomes, learning objectives. So simulation can be used for rehearsal purposes, for renewal of skills, for reinforcement, for feedback, for um, in Pakistan, we don't have fitness to practice issues, but I think that is something Pakistan Medical Commission will look into when medical tribunal will have cases around patient complaints. And I think we need to re start revalidation of skills as well. So I've not practiced in last five or six or 10 years, but if I go back to Pakistan, I can just start practice in any hospital. No one's gonna ask me that you have not been practicing in last 10 years what would happen to your skills. So there's skill decay happening. So I need, and I should be revalidating my skills. We can also always pilot and redesign new practices. So if there's any new protocol, new practice, why do we directly have to implement it in, uh, on a patient? We can actually apply that in a simulated condition and then see the reaction and then see if we can actually implement or apply it to the patients. Likewise, it's a risk-free environment. Patient safety concerns are very, minimal in simulated environment. It engages the learners, students can learn from their mistakes. They are free to make mistakes. It helps them improve their critical thinking, 
You can do team work exercise. So I have a paper on multidisciplinary team training for neonatal resuscitation with one of my students. And we train a lot of people as to work as a team. I think we have never taught our trainees to work as a team or to be a leader of a team. Are we working on that as part of our curriculum? I don't think so. We just allow them to learn through experience. Some of them experience based on their enthusiasm engagement, some of them don't. So we need to, and this way we can observe our parchment more closely as well. And there's a lot of literature or learning theories that support uh, the entire protocol. There's adult learning theory, which explains that adults need to know why they're learning. Learning should be practical, immediate. There's constructivism, which talks about scaffolding and building knowledge and skills. There's experiential learning theory of call that talks about providing them with experiences and reflective observation. And then there are models by Banner that talks about how people learn from being a novice to an expert and how they develop expertise. So all these models or learning theories support the use of simulation in the curriculum for both undergraduate, postgraduate, and even continuous professional development as well. So there are different advantages of simulation, which involves structured learning. We can practice range of difficulty levels, different levels. It promotes ethical training. Uh, readily available than real patients. You can develop a structured curriculum around it. You can give feedback. You can even assess the students and complex tasks can be broken down into different parts and then learn separately. And then you can bring them together and learn all together. However, at the same time, there are certain limitations to this uh, process as well, such as uh, recruiting and training of simulated patients sometimes become difficult. It's not possible to simulate all the physical signs, heart sounds, edema, goiter is very hard to simulate as well. Learning through simulation affects its application in unpredictable situations. So yes, uh, it may happen in that way, but the more you improve the fidelity, the more you improve the authenticity, the better it would be. Simulation trained virtual doctors do not show the same confidence in real settings. Yes, that's why I'm not saying that we replace the real patients, but we use simulation to complement the actual learning that is happening. And, there was a headline, a lot of media was against it as well, doctors to be tested by bogus patients. So uh, they're just saying that, okay, uh, this if you know that th this doctor has been trained just on a robot, will you trust that doctor? So a GP was quoted saying, there are much better ways of assessing people performance than using joke patient. So there are people, it's an insult to the whole profession. So there are people who are against simulated learning, but I think in, with increasing patient safety concerns and societal demands, we need to uh, change things as well. Likewise, a lot of people say that um, it's this, you don't get the same feeling with the simulation that you get with real patient and you are not able to learn. But again, you can destroy a real patient uh, with virtual reality or with simulation. You just do whatever you want, you learn, and then you press the reset and everything goes back to normal. In human life, you don't and you can't press a reset button to bring everything back to normal. So I think we need to inculcate simulation in our training as well. And for that, this is the cycle that we need to follow. We need to prepare the patient. We need to prepare the student. We need to brief the student about the learning objectives, about the learning outcomes. We need to immerse them in the simulation learning activity. We need to then debrief them, give them feedback, encourage reflection from them, and then evaluate uh, their entire performance as well. And then there are different models uh, related to that, like patent four steps approach and CISFR approach uh, that involves about how we can actually teach uh, different people as well. Ensure that you are encouraging reflection and reflecting thinking at the same time so that students are reflecting on what they have learned from that experiences, what were the misconceptions, how they can improve their clinical practice in future. And because assessment drives learning, make sure you are assessing the students at the same time using checklist or using protocol or using tools as well the way they have performed in all those different areas. So the take home message from uh, today's session is that simulation was introduced to overcome challenges in clinical skills teaching. It provides a consistent scenario, enables important aspect of clinical competence to be taught and assessed, but learning through simulation may affect its application in unpredictable situation. And that is why I would recommend to use it as a complementary factor to complement real life teaching, to improve patient safety and for students to rehearse and practice rather than totally replacing real patients. So there are some references of my talk and thank you very much for listening to me. So I'm giving uh, Dr. Uh, 
Thank you, thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, that was a great presentation, and I believe that uh, our participant uh, will really benefit from this. And furthermore, uh, more encouraging interest from our participant, more than 300 registration was done for this uh, webinar. And I think right now more than 100 uh, participants are online for this uh, webinar session. That was very encouraging effort. Uh, from PGMI and of course Dr. SNCD. Uh, sir, I'm, uh, before going to the answer question answer session, uh, I want to briefly explain the skill lab of uh, PGMI. Sir, we have in PGMI our fully uh, skill lab are fully function nowadays, and we have all the high fidelity, medium fidelity, and low fidelity simulator are available, and they are fully function. In the high fidelity uh, fidelity simulation, we have a sim mom, uh, sim baby and sim mega 3g these are for the uh, starting from the observation tell the feedback they can use it for the simulation in a surgical side we have laparoscopic uh, simulator we have ent simulator we have uh, gyne we have i simulator we have peer simulator for the surgical side in a medium uh, fidelity simulation we have a mega core kili uh, simulator and we have a lot of simulation or skill lab activities in the low fidelity uh, fertility simulations. Now, sir, uh, regarding the uh, further future uh, collaboration, future uh, activities for the skill lab in the PGMI, we are going to start the simulation courses in PGMI skill lab. We are working on the courses we are developing uh, for the PTC. We, are, we have developed primary trauma course. We develop their competencies. We are developing the scenarios, and that uh, recently, in, uh, in near, near future, we are starting the simulation courses uh, here in Skill Lab. Uh, and now, in 13 March onward, uh, we, uh, PGMI is starting uh, critical courses with the collaboration of Aga Khan. Uh, that is an announcement for the participant. So right now, the PGMI Skill Lab is fully function. And uh, we are uh, really working to start uh, for the future for these trainee and students. So my question is that, um, as we know that the real situation of the skill lab in, uh, in the colleges and the hospitals, so that not is up to that standard, which we want to be that as a medical education is. So how we will involve the students and the trainer in the skill lab to develop their uh, uh, clinical skills? How you will involve, sir, and what type of activities we can start it to involve them in a clinical skill lab? I think uh, if I talk about because PGMI is mostly dealing with postgraduate students, so I think the first thing that we need to develop and clearly understand is what are the expectations from a trainee after the first year, after second year, after third year. So, what interestable professional activities? So, the new term that is being used by uh, Olet and Kate and uh, a lot of uh, medical education is interestable professional activity. What activities can you trust or interest a healthcare provider at a given level that he or she should be able to do independently? So we have to identify that for first year, for the second year, for the third year, for the fourth year. We need to add an OSCE for each year. So it should not be right now what's happening in our training program. It's you just move from first year to second year, second year to third year, fourth year, and uh, after four years, then you realize, oh, I forgot to give my IMM. And you give your IMM after four years, and then you start giving your FCPS part. This should not be like that. Each from first year to second year, there should be an exam internally. If not from uh, CPSP, you should take it internally. And on what basis you need to have an interestable professional activities identified, which should be taught in that first year, practiced in that first year, and examined in that first year. And then the trainee should be able to move into next year. You need to define clear, interestable professional activities or objectives or outcomes, train them, assess them, and that is should be leading to promotion as well. And that is, I think, uh, will help uh, improve things. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your honorable time, sir. Inshallah, in the near future, we will collaborate you and with the university, sir. And thank you very much, sir, for the today webinar session. If you have any questions, sir, please. Thank you very much for your time and for your invitation. And I look forward to collaborating with you in future as well. Inshallah. Thank you, Inshallah. Thank you very much, sir. Love is love.